Hi, Mighty Mustangs. It's Mrs. Troncone. Just want to let you know that I miss all of you, from your little kindergartners all the way up to the fifth graders. And I hope you are all doing well. I hope you've been enjoying the journey of Mr. Popper's Penguins. Today, I'm going to read chapter 15. But we did leave off in chapter 14 with Mr. Greenbaum wanting to see the act of the Penguin Poppers. And he said, if they're any good, they'll be able to perform in his theaters across the coast, from coast to coast in the United States of America. So today I'm gonna to pick up with chapter 15, Poppers Performing Penguins, and let's see if they've got what it takes and what is Mr. Greenbaum looking for in an act. Mr. Greenbaum is willing to put them in the theater, but let's see if they're gonna be good enough. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy today's read aloud of chapter 15, Popper's Performing Penguins. Popper's Performing Penguins. At that moment, they were interrupted by the manager who came in with a groan. What's the matter? asked Mr. Greenbaum. The marvelous Marcos who closed the program haven't turned up and the audience are demanding their money back. What are you going to do? asked Mr. Greenbaum. Give it to them, I suppose. And here it is, Saturday night, the biggest night of the week. I hate to think of losing all that money. I have an idea, said Mrs. Popper. Maybe you won't have to lose it as long as it's the end of the program. Why don't we just have the penguins rehearse in there on a real stage? We'd have more room and I think the audience would enjoy it. All right, said the manager, let's try it. So the penguins had their first rehearsal on a real stage. The manager stepped out on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, raising his hand with your kind indulgence. We are going to try out a little novelty number tonight. Owing to unforeseen circumstances, the marvelous Marcos are unable to appear. We are going to let you see a rehearsal of the Popper performing penguins instead. I thank you. In a dignified way, the Poppers and the penguins walked out on the stage and Mrs. Popper sat down at the piano. Aren't you going to take off your gloves to play? asked the manager. Oh no, said Mrs. Popper. I'm so used to playing with them that I'll keep them on, if you don't mind. Then she started Schubert's military march. The penguins began to drill very nicely, wheeling and changing their formations with great precision, until Mrs. Popper stopped playing in the middle of the piece. The audience clapped vigorously. There's more to it, explained Mrs. Popper, half to the manager and half to the audience, where they form in a hollow square and march in that formation. It's so late, we'll skip that tonight and jump to the second part. You sure you don't want to take your gloves off, madam, asked the manager. Mrs. Popper smilingly shook her head and began the Merry Widow Waltz. Ten of the penguins now formed in a semicircle as Nelson and Columbus in their midst put on a wild sparring contest. Their round black heads leaned far back so that they could watch each other with round white eyes. Gork, said Nelson, punching Columbus in the stomach with his right flipper and then trying to push him over with his left flipper. Gaw, said Columbus, going into a clinch and hanging his head over Nelson's shoulder as he tried to punch him in the back. Hey, no fair, said the manager. Columbus and Nelson broke loose as the other ten penguins looking on applauded with their flippers. Columbus now sparred politely with Nelson until Nelson hit him on the eye, whereupon Columbus retreated with a loud ork. The other penguins began to clap and the audience joined them. As Mrs. Popper finished the waltz, both Nelson and Columbus stopped fighting. 
put down their flippers and stood still, facing each other. Which bird won? Who's ahead? shouted the audience. Gook, said all the ten penguins in the semicircle. This must have meant look, for Nelson turned to look at them, and Columbus immediately punched him in the stomach with one flipper and knocked him down with the other. Nelson lay there with his eyes closed. Columbus then counted ten over the prostrate Nelson, and again the ten other penguins applauded. That's part of the act, explained Janie. The other penguins all like Columbus to win, and so they all say gook at the end. That always makes Nelson look away, so Columbus can suck him good. Nelson now rose to his feet. And all the penguins formed in a row and bowed to the manager. Thank you, said the manager, bowing back. Now comes part three, said Mr. Popper. Oh, Papa, said Mrs. Popper, you forgot to bring the two painting step ladders and the board. That's all right, said the manager. I'll get the stage hands to bring some. In no time at all, a pair of ladders and a board were brought in and Mr. Popper and the children showed them how the ladders had to be set up with the board resting on top. Then Mrs. Popper began slaying, began playing the pretty descriptive piece by the brook. At this point in the act, the penguins always forgot their discipline and got dreadfully excited. They would all begin shoving at once to see which could be the first to climb the ladders. However, the children had always told Mr. Popper that the act was all the funnier for all this pushing and scrambling, and Mr. Popper supposed it was. So now with a great deal of squawking, the penguins fought and climbed the ladders and ran across the board in complete confusion often knocking each other entirely off to the floor below and then hurrying to toboggan down the other ladder and knock off any penguins who were trying to climb up there. This part of the act was very wild and noisy in spite of Mrs. Popper's delicate music. The manager and the audience were all holding their sides laughing. At last, Mrs. Popper got to the end of the music and took off her gloves, You'll have to get those ladders off the stage or I'll never get these birds under control, said Mr. Popper. The curtain is supposed to fall at this point. So the manager gave the signal for the curtain to go down and the audience stood up and cheered. When the ladders had been taken away, the manager had 12 ice cream cones brought in for the penguins. Then Janie and Bill began to cry, so the manager ordered several more, and everybody had one. Mr. Greenbaum was the first to congratulate the poppers. I don't mind telling you, Mr. Popper, that I think you've got something absolutely unique in those birds. Your act is a sensation, and the way you help out my friend, the manager, here shows that you're real troopers, the kind we need in the show business. I like to predict that your penguins will soon be packing the biggest theaters from Oregon to Maine. And now to come to terms, Mr. Popper, he continued, how about a 10-week contract at $5,000 a week? Is that all right, Mama? asked Mr. Popper. Yes, that's very satisfactory, answered Mrs. Popper. Well then, said Mr. Grant Greenbaum, just sign these papers and be ready to open next Thursday in Seattle. And thanks again, said the manager. Would you mind putting on your gloves again for just a minute, Mrs. Popper? I'd like you to start playing that military march again and let the penguins parade for a minute. I want to get my ushers in here to look at those birds. It will be a lesson to them. I'm Mrs. Monaghan. I teach basic skills instruction. Today I'm going to read chapter 16, On the Road. My bags are packed and I'm ready to go. Hold on to your seats and enjoy. Chapter 16, On the Road. During the next day, there was much to be done at 432 Proudfoot Avenue. 
There were new clothes to buy for all of them and the old ones to pack away in mothballs. Then Mrs. Popper had to scrub and polish and straighten the whole place, for she was much too good a housekeeper to leave everything at sixes and sevens while the Poppers were away. Mr. Greenbaum sent them their first week's pay in advance. The first thing they did was to pay off the man who had installed the freezing plant in the basement. He had been getting rather uneasy about his money, and after all, without him, they could never have trained the penguins. Next, they sent a check to the company who had been shipping the fresh fish all the way from the coast. At last, everything was done, and Mr. Popper turned the key in the door of the little house. They were a little late in arriving at the railway station on account of the argument with the traffic policeman. The argument was on account of the accident of the two taxicabs. With four poppers and twelve penguins, not to mention the eight suitcases and pail of water with the live fish for the penguins' lunch, Mr. Popper found that they could not all fit into one cab, so he had to call a second one. Each of the taxi drivers was eager to be the first to get to the station and surprise the people there by opening the door of his cab and letting out six penguins. So they raced each other all the way, and in the last block, they tried to pass each other, and one of the fenders got torn off. The traffic officer naturally got very much annoyed. The train was about to pull out of the station when they arrived. Even with both taxi drivers helping them through the gate and over the brass rails onto the rear observation platform, they barely made it. The penguins were gasping. Oh, it had been decided that Mr. Popper should ride in the baggage car with the penguins to keep them from getting nervous, while Mrs. Popper and the children should ride in one of the Pullmans. Because of getting on at the observation end of the train, Mr. Popper had to take the birds through the whole length of the train. It was easy enough to get them through the club car, even with the pail of fish to carry. In the sleeping cars, however, where the porter was already making up some of the berths, there was trouble. The porter's ladders offered too much temptation to the penguins. There were a dozen happy orcs from a dozen ecstatic beaks. Poppers, performing penguins, completely forgetting their discipline, fought to climb the ladders and get into the upper berths. Poor Mr. Popper. One old lady screamed that she was going to get off the train, whether it was going 90 miles an hour or not. A gentleman wearing a clergyman's collar suggested opening a window so that the penguins could jump out. Two porters tried to shoo the birds out of the berths. Finally, the conductor and the brakeman with a lantern came to the rescue. It was quite a while before Mr. Popper got his pet safely into the baggage car. Mrs. Popper worried a little at the start over the idea of having Janie and Bill miss 10 weeks of school while they were on the road, though the children did not seem to mind. And you must remember, my love, said Mr. Popper, who had never before been out of Stillwater, in spite of his dreams of distant countries, that travel is very broadening. From the start, the Penguins were a riotous success. Even their opening performance in Seattle went off without a hitch probably because they had already rehearsed on a real stage. It was here that the Penguins added a little novelty number of their own to the program. They were the first thing on the bill. When they finished their regular act, the audience went wild. They clapped and stamped and roared for more of Popper's performing Penguins. Janie and Bill helped their father herd the Penguins off the stage so that the next act could go on. This next act was a tightrope walker named Monsieur Duval. The trouble was that instead of watching him from the wings as they should have done, the penguins got interested and walked out on the stage again to watch him more closely. Unfortunately, at this moment, Monsieur Duval was doing a very difficult dance on the wire overhead. The audience, of course, had thought that the penguins were all through and were very much pleased to see them return and line up with their backs to the audience and look up at Monsieur Duval, dancing carefully on the wire high above them. This made everyone laugh so hard that Monsieur Duval lost his balance. Ork, said the, the penguins, waddling away hurriedly in order not to be under him when he fell. Cleverly recovering his balance, Monsieur Duval caught the wire by the inside of his elbow and saved himself. 
He was very angry when he saw the pauper performing penguins opening wide their 12 red beaks as if they were laughing at him. Go away, you stupid things, he said to them in French. Or, said the penguins, pretending not to understand and making remarks to each other in penguin language about Monsieur Duval. And whenever they appeared, the more they interfered with the other acts on the program, the better the audiences liked them.